Ephesians 5, look at verse uh, 18. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Last week we looked at four, uh, part four of this series, A Renewed Walk, and uh, we, sit, we looked at walking in the Spirit. We focused for, on the first point of being, having a Spirit-filled walk, which contained two things, to have a con con controlled walk, be not drunk with wine. In other words, we ought to be influenced uh, not by wine, but by the Spirit of God. We should never be under the influence of any substance, controlled by any substance, but under the control of the Holy Spirit. We also looked at having a consistent walk. To be filled with the Spirit is a disposition that we must continually have. We must constant, consistently be walking in the Spirit of God. In other words, the Holy Spirit ought to be in control of our lives every moment. We must have a consistent walk by being led by the Spirit of God, by the Word of God, obeying Him in all things. Now when we're saved, we noted the fact that we were indwelt by the Spirit of God and indeed we are sealed unto the day of redemption. But being filled is something that we must maintain on a daily basis because uh, Christians are indwelt, period. They're sealed unto the day of redemption. But they can walk a walk that's not exhibiting uh, the filling of the Holy Spirit. In other words, they're not controlled or influenced or led by the Spirit of God. And so being filled with the Spirit must have a consistent walk. We noted the fact that we can grieve the Spirit or quench the Spirit. And, uh, and, and that's, you know, two great realities in our life. And, uh, and so we have the Spirit of God as believers. We need to walk in the Spirit of God. Galatians 5.16, this I say then, walk in the Spirit, look at this, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And so the indwelling has to do with our salvation, and the filling has to do with our sanctification. Okay, and this is what we're looking at in this series. Not only the salvation aspect, but the sanctification aspect. Yes, we have the Spirit. Yes, we live in the Spirit. Look at this, Galatians 5.25. If you live in the Spirit, what shall we do? Let us also walk in the Spirit. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, walk ye, also, walk ye in Him. And so that, that's the component that we struggle with. Salvations of God. We, we're broken before the Lord. We ask God to help us, he, uh, uh, to save us and then to help us. And He gives us His Holy Spirit. And by the way, when we're not walking in the Spirit of God, God lets us know. That's, that's the whole purpose of the grieving of the Spirit of God. He's grieved. In other words, we're not walking like we should, and God helps us get back into that place where we should be. So it is our responsibility to maintain a walk that is uh, filled with the Spirit of God. You know, like I said, again, we'll look at this just briefly. We're not asking God to fill us like as if we, we don't have the Spirit of God within us. The Spirit lives in us. It's not like we're asking God, fill us with your Holy Spirit, and, your, and the Holy Spirit is like pulled out like water in us. It's not, it's, it's, it's not that you know, concept at all as some charismatic movements like to portray it. Okay? The Holy Spirit is indwelt within us, and He wants to have full authority and reign. He wants to lead us and guide us from within. Okay? It's not like, oh, fill me, Lord, please, fill me, Holy Spirit, come down. And then we have this, uh, you know, outer body experiences and all the rest of that, or we shake, or we do something, or we've got goosebumps and all the rest of that. It's got nothing to do with that. As a matter of fact, the context has more to do with Christian character. Up to this point, we've been told to walk in love, to walk in the light, to walk in wisdom, and now to be filled with the Spirit, I believe, is to be walking in the Spirit of God. And to have a renewed walk is to have a Spirit-filled walk. And under this point, I would say, being Spirit-filled is to have a Scripture-filled walk. Uh, hence, verse 19. Uh, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So a person who is filled with the Holy Spirit is someone who desires to be filled with the Word of God because you cannot speak the Word of God if you're not filled with the Word of God, if the Word of God is not in you. 
And so the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, by the way, are in complete harmony. They're not working against each other, they work with each other. The Holy Spirit, as we see in Ephesians 6, uh, we see that the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. And the Holy Spirit leads us to the attention of Christ and His Word. That's the whole purpose. The Holy Spirit will never lead us away from the person of Jesus Christ and will never lead us away from the Word of God. Let me tell you something. If you have visions and dreams and experiences that are not in line with the Scriptures and that even contradict the Word of God, that's not of the Spirit of God. You can mark that down. In our generation, we have the Word of God, the final authority, that is for our faith and practice. If I have a dream that is not in line with God's Word or an experience or something that takes place that is not in line with the Word of God, I have to be sure that that's not of the Spirit of God. That's why John says, Beloved, test all spirits, whether they be of God. Because the Spirit of God will always you know, call us to the person of Jesus Christ, okay? Have a look in John 16, verse 13. How bit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come, and shall glorify who? Me, Jesus, for he shall receive, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. So the whole purpose is to elevate the person of Jesus Christ and his words. A Bible teacher once said, he who is filled with the Spirit doesn't think of himself, neither about the Spirit with, it, with whom he is filled, but he is only focused on the Lord because that's what the Spirit of God causes us to do. The Holy Spirit reveals the heart, mind, wisdom of God to his disciples. 1 Corinthians 2.10, but God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit for the spirit searcheth all things yea the deep things of god and to re be revealed means to ta to take off or to uncover to disclose to make manifest to bring out and so god worked through the holy apostles to bring out make known the truth of god's word that they were taught by jesus christ and they will be they were moved by the holy spirit to the ministry of the word ephesians 3 verse 2 to 5 if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given unto me to you would, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I write aforetime a few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in this mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the, unto the sons of men, as it is now, look at this again, revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets, how? By the Spirit. If you turn your Bibles with me, leave your finger there in Ephesians 5, but turn your Bibles with me to Hebrews chapter number 2, and I just want to stop and focus on this just for a moment, just so you can see that some of the servants of God had specific ministry. And within those ministries, God gave them gifts by the Holy Spirit to fulfill their ministry. But let me say this to you, the, the main ministry was to convey the Word of God to people. It wasn't necessarily about the gifts or, the, or, or the, uh, the, the experience and the wonders and the signs. See, all those things shouldn't take away from the Word of God. All those things should complement the Word of God. Today we have a movement of the Holy Spirit where the Holy Spirit is elevated above, above the Word. It's elevated above Christ. Experience is elevated above uh, Christian character. And I don't believe that's of God. I really don't. Look at Hebrews chapter number 2, look at verse 1. Therefore we ought to give more earnest heed to the things which we have what? Which we have what? Heard. Lest at any time we should let him slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense or reward, how, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation. Now, by the way, he's just simply saying that the word of God spoken uh, uh, by any person at any time, if that was rejected, there's a consequence to it. And, 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 and what kind of consequence do you think is going to take place if now you reject the word even by the Son of God, who in, who in time past spoke by the prophets, and now uh, in this time, in the last days, spoke by the Son of God? 
You reject His word. Uh, there, is, there is, you know, no doubt consequences for that. But I want to make this point. He goes, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. By who? The apostles. The Bible makes it clear that the word of the Lord was confirmed to us. The word of the Lord, see, Jesus had his apostles and he gave them the word that the Father gave him. That was part of his ministry. And then he sent his disciples out and wanted them to go out and fulfill the Great Commission. We are byproducts of that. You know what God wants? He wants his word to be perpetual from one generation to another generation. And it's not always accompanied by signs and wonders. You know why? Even if you go back to the Old Testament and you see the ten plagues that took place to demonstrate the power of God to lead the Israelites out of bondage. The generations that were simply to come heard of what happened in Egypt and they believed it. They didn't see it, but they believed it. Why? Because it was written. And, and what God wanted is that that generation will pass it to their generation. Uh, uh, regarding what? The revelation of God and His majesty and His rule and His power and His goodness and His mercy. It would be passed down to the next generation. There, there's not always signs and wonders and, 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 and the demonstration, if you will. They were there for a purpose. And that purpose was to confirm the Word. And that Word we have with us. It's so powerful. This, this is so powerful. If you read it and you hide it in your heart and you believe it, it will do a miracle work in your life. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces even through uh, the bone and marrow and aims for the intents and the motives of our hearts. It is so convicting. It operates. That's why people despise the Word of God and the preaching of the Word of God because he knows that the preaching in which he chose uh, confounds the wise. It reveals truth and it makes them look stupid. But you know what? They should come under the wisdom of God and agree with God and no one understand that there's no wisdom outside. There's no true wisdom outside of God. But the point here is he spoke by the Lord they begin this, uh, 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 spoken by the Lord, was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. God also bearing them witness, how? Both with signs and wonders and with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost. Now look at this. According to his own what? Will. I don't mind. I said it last week at all, not for a second, that if God wanted to give any one of us the gift of signs and wonders and all the rest of it, those signs gift, go ahead. But you can't say that God is still working that way when we don't see it exhibited. And it's not a cop-out to say, well, I'm going, to be a I'm going to be a Thomas here. If I don't see it, I'm not going to believe it. No. Well, signs and wonders are there to be seen. They're not done behind a camera or in a stage or in the corner. They're there to be done publicly. So if you're going to say that you have the ability to do it, we sure want to see it demonstrated like the Book of Acts style. I, haven't, I don't have any problems with anybody having these gifts, but what's the purpose for it today? Does it bring attention to the Word or to the Lord? What's it doing? Because the truth of the matter is, even people, when they saw our Lord Jesus Christ before miracles, some of them or many of them still didn't believe. Why? Because they weren't interested in the Word of God. Miracles won't cause a person to believe. Remember the rich man in hell? When he said, let me go and witness, uh, send Lazarus to go and witness to my brothers for they'll believe one risen from the dead. What did Abraham, where did he, Abraham directed them. He directed him where? The law and the prophets. By the way, the law and the prophets point to Jesus Christ. They testify of him. The law and the prophets in the Old Testament point to Jesus. Listen, the New Testament, Holy Spirit through men point to Jesus. It's all about him. And we're talking about the biblical Jesus, amen. We're not talking about this in another Jesus of the charismatic movement that undermines the authority and the deity of the Lord and the Lordship of Christ. So God is the one who chooses to gift men to fulfill his purpose. And the main focus was the word of God being taught to God's people. 
And as we continue to study the Bible, the Holy Spirit helps us to understand the Holy Scriptures. Go to 1 John chapter 2 and I'll, I'll show you something there. Leave your finger in Ephesians 5. We'll come back to it. 1 John chapter number 2. What we have to understand is that the Holy Spirit is role within us is to help us uh, with uh, spiritual discernment regarding the Word of God. He helps us understand Bible truths and doctrines regarding the person of Jesus Christ. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, John writes to believers, he says, Little children, in the la it is the last time, and as ye have heard, that Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they, weren't, they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. But ye have a what? You have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. Uh, I have not written unto you, because ye know not the truth, and we're talking about the truth of the deity of Christ here, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is in any Christ that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Let that therefore abide in you, which ye have what? Heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he had promised us, even eternal life. These things I have written unto you concerning them that seduce you. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. And ye, ye need, he says here, and ye need not that any man teach you. Well, hang on a minute. What do you mean, any man teach you? Well, but as the same anointing teaches you of all things. He's not saying that you don't need me and apostle John to teach you. He's teaching us. He doesn't, he's not saying that we don't need any teachers in our life. He's just simply saying regarding this subject that Jesus is who he says he is. You don't need anyone to teach you about that. The whole, you've been taught about it. And listen, the Holy Spirit's confirmed it to you. And so in context, but the same anointing teacheth you of all things and is truth. It is not a lie, even as, uh, as it is have taught you Ye shall abide in him. See, what, what, what does the unholy spirit want us to do? Deviate from Christ. Reject Christ's lordship. He doesn't want us to follow Christ. The Holy Spirit is the one that points us to Christ. It's even the God the Father that says, this is my beloved son. Hear him. Hear him. Uh, uh, who do men say that I am, Peter? Oh, you're one of the prophets, John the Baptist, risen from the dead. But who do you say that I am? Oh, you're the son of the living God. Well, blessed, blessed art thou, Simon Barjonas, that flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but who? But my Father which is in heaven. So God has a way to reveal things to babes, those that are humble, those that are not wise in their own consent, those that have a heart to know the truth of God's word and God through his word and by his spirit confirming his word to us. It, 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 makes it known very clearly listen who's the one that tries to undo and unravel false teachers antichrist those people that masquerade as their teachers of righteousness but they're not and people are deceivers because they use bible connotations they use holy spirit words like holy spirit jesus you know it, it, it they do that to deceive people and they and and, they, and by the way can i say this to you good christians have been deceived i say good christians believers and so he, John, is simply, want, he doesn't want him to be deceived. Remember who taught you? Remember who confirmed it in your heart? So false teachers try to undermine the word of God that takes place in our heart. And what, what's, what simply strengthens those things that we've heard and learned and confirmed by the Holy Spirit? Well, the word of God. That's why we need to go back and read it and reread it and fall in love with it and continue to uh, know it and study it. Why? Because this is our strength. This is why we need to be re reminded and refreshed by God's word. 
And so the Holy Spirit and the Word of God are in complete harmony. Notice what Paul states to the Colossians in Colossians 3 verse 16. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you how? Richly. In all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another, here it is again, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. It's similar to what he wrote to the Ephesians. The only difference here is really, he says, let the word of who? Christ dwell in you. And so this is why I believe that being filled with the Holy Spirit and have the word of God being filled with us, they're, they're compatible, they're in harmony. Because the Holy Spirit will lead us to the Word of God so we could gravitate to it, desire it, and, and the Word of God will lead us to embrace the things of God. To dwell means to take residence. And so what Paul is simply saying is let the Word of God make itself at home in your heart. How do we do that? Meditate upon it. Learn it. Memorize it. Ah, live it out. As we soak our hearts and minds with God's word and seek to walk to, uh, to obey him by the leading of the Holy Spirit, then the word of God is enriched in our hearts. John Phillips says, we need to get the word out of our Bibles and into our hearts. The word of Christ dwelling in our hearts becomes a vast treasury of wisdom upon which the Holy Spirit can draw us and, and guide us through the various uh, varying circumstances of life. And it's true. How can the Holy Spirit lead you if you don't have any Bible? The more Bible you have in your heart, the more the Holy Spirit can use it in your life and lead you and guide you. And so, if you're under the control of the Holy Spirit, you'll be led to meditate upon the Word of God and the Word of God will affect your heart so much so that you will walk and talk as a renewed person. So the effects of alcohol are evident. Uh, people who are under the influence of alcohol have an unstable, crooked walk and sinful and corrupt communication. The communication is not edifying, it's corrupt, it's not encouraging. But people who are under the influence of the Holy Spirit will be led to sacred communication. Their speech will be wholesome, healthy, graceful, filled with scripture that edifies others. And this is why the first thing that we look at here is speaking to yourselves in Psalms, hymns, spiritual form, so, uh, songs. So a, a scripture-filled life is an edifying walk. It edifies you, and in turn you edify others. You build them up. We're told to encourage one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. I would say all these th three are related and refer to the lyrics of God's word. You really can't have... Uh, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs without the word of God. Amen? And so the psalms referred, I would say, to the Old Testament writers, mostly composed by David. In Psalm 105 verse 2, sing unto him, sing psalms unto him, talk ye of all his wonderful works. And so when we're filled with the Spirit, we'll have a desire for the word of God and a desire to continue to encourage one another of who God is. We want to talk about the Lord. In Psalm 145 and verse 5, I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty and of thy wondrous works. A preacher once said, the divine infilling opens the mouth to talk about the things of the Lord and enlarges the heart to share these things with others. It's, it's the way it is. It's tremendous. Uh, the Spirit of God leads us to Scripture so that we can encourage one another. Speaking to yourselves. The word yourselves emphasizes the fact that believers are one body, therefore members of each other. Romans chapter 12 verse 5. So we being many are one body in Christ and everyone, everyone members of one another. Speaking to yourselves. You Ephesian church, encourage yourselves. How? With Scripture. Speak it, and then later on he says, sing it. It's the whole purpose that we meet together. We hear the word of God, we're built up in the faith. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Verse 12, and for the what? For the perfecting of the saints. For the work of the ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ. And so the whole purpose of coming together as a church is to encourage one another. Listen, not discourage one another. We, you know, I think one of the saddest things when the body of Christ comes together and we're not talking about spiritual things. We're not encouraging one another. 
with the Word of God. The Word of God ought, ought to always be in our hearts and minds and how we can be giving a word of exhortation and encouragement. Not always a word of rebuke. I mean, that has its place, but over here it's more encouraging. Encouraging one another. Edifying one another. Building each other up. Hebrews 10 verse 24. Let us consider one another and provoke unto love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. So much the more of you see the seed as you see the day approaching. Now, I don't know about you, but, I, I, you know, we're not going to get the, world, the Word of God out there in the world. This is when we gather together, we, we need more of God's Word. We need to sing about God's Word. We need to teach God's Word. Why? Because this is what edifies us to keep on keeping on as Christians. To stay faithful to, the, to walking in love, walking in light, walking in wisdom. To stay faithful in doing those things that we'll see in the future. Our responsibilities to one and another. You know, submitting ourselves in the fear of God. Being faithful in our marriage. Faithful as a father. Faithful as a mother. Faithful as uh, parents. And faithful as children. As a worker. As a boss. As a, as a soldier putting the whole armor of God. To be faithful in these areas. It's the whole purpose of the Word of God. To help us to be a people that are not of the world, but of God. Godly people. Sober-minded people. Not staggering, foolish people that just are lost. The Psalms and hymns would be implemented in the services and gathering. And the church will come together means that they will worship God, speak of the Lord. Even the Lord practiced uh, uh, singing a hymn when he finished the Last Supper with his disciples. Notice what the Bible says there in Mark 14, 26. And when they had sung a hymn, and when I, get to, when I get to this point in my Bible reading, I cannot help but wonder how the voice of our Savior would sound like. Just to see, just to hear him sing. And they went out in the Mount of Olives just before he was going to go out and be betrayed. It was a custom to come together and sing. How many songs? Well, it's up to the people. Over here they sung a hymn. They sung one. They had their time together. They were practicing what the Father had for the Son to do. And more than just having a, a supper, it was a great redemption coming. A great salvation. And we're told not only sing psalms and hymns, but spiritual songs. Spiritual songs are composed by spirit-led people. Songs that are godly. Songs that relate to godly things. They're spiritual. In other words, they're not worldly songs. Spiritual songs are biblical-based, God-honoring, written and sung by godly people. So why do you emphasize that? Well, if you know Elvis Presley, he, he sung gospel songs. Uh, if you go and listen to some of the old time hymns, he sung some of them. But am I going to listen to Elvis Presley who sings other wicked songs that are relating about girls? No. Oh. Some believe that he was a Christian. He was, he was uh, in the beginning in church and all the rest of it and Maybe backslidden. Look, I don't know where he's at, but I know that he influenced more worldly people than he did Christians. And so although he's got a, a beautiful voice, and although he has a spiritual song that he perhaps is sung by a spiritual person, can I listen to that? Well, you, perhaps you've got liberty to do that. But I believe spiritual songs ought to be sung by spiritual people. They need to be composed by spiritual people, sung by spiritual people. And I'm not saying that spiritual people can't fall. Look at David. But they get up again and we know and understand that it was transparent. Psalm 51 continued to love the Lord and press on and fulfill the heart of God. It's very sad, however. And I, I, when I say very sad, I mean very sad. That Christians who are matured in the faith and grown up in the Lord still listen to worldly music. Worldly music 
by worldly singers that appeal only to the flesh. Some of these music, I call them slit your wrist music. You know, believe me, I was there when, when, when I was a young Christian and I was struggling with a decision, the hardest decision I ever had to make. And listening sometimes, you know, you, you sneak one little worldly music in and identify with the breakup because they talk about breakup and all the rest of it and all. You just want to drive your car over the cliff. <laughs> Are your heart broken and you're crying and phew. You know, these worldly musics only focus on yourself. Self-pity, not on him. I'm not saying you can't cry, but what are you crying for? Poor, poor me, poor me, poor me, 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 me. They're singing about me, 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 glorify me and how that person hurt me and I don't really care about you and all the rest of it. You know, worldly music and Christians, they, they sneak one in. They get in the car and they sneak it in. Or maybe they're doing some shopping. I don't know about you, but when I'm hearing worldly music out there, my foot begins to tap and I'm thinking, I better stop doing that. Hurry up, do your shop, get out. I remember this song. Woo. Trying to tune out. And you know, if you're singing in your heart to the Lord, you will tune it out. I guarantee you. You wouldn't even know it's there. I guarantee you. But there are moments that you stop and you pause and you think, you know, Christians, get that worldly music out of your car, out of your, out of your home, out of your head, out of your heart. You don't need that. You know what that does? It grieves God. and it, You're not walking in the Spirit. You're not going to sing to God. You know what's going to do? You're going to bring glory to yourself. It's not elevating Christ. It's unholy music that arouses the flesh. Worldly songs do not honor and glorify God. And I guarantee you, the Spirit of God will never lead you to sing worldly songs. Never. Well, you say, well, what about the worldly style of music with Christian lyrics? Is that okay? I'm glad you asked because I, I get that. No. You say, what do you mean by worldly style of music? We'll get there in a moment. I don't believe that the music that we hear in the world is neutral. I believe music is a language that has power to communicate to the soul. And if you don't understand that point, then you're not going to really understand the effects that music can have upon your life. I'm not talking about lyrics, I'm talking about music. Music was one of the hardest things for me to let go as a Christian. I let go of the alcohol, let go of cigarettes. I let go of those substances that I was addicted to. I let them go by the grace of God, mind you. God helped me, God, God helped me with that. But music was the hardest. And so I eventually got rid of the worldly music, but then implemented Christian contemporary music. Now, I was still young in the Lord, but when someone gave me gospel rap, I thought, gospel rap? And they're rapping about how Jesus is the only way. I thought, absolutely is the only way. This is good stuff. They're rapping about, wow. And so I would sing along with them. And I would bob my head in the car. Yeah, old Bob, Jesus is the only way. There's no other way. Yeah, and it was all sound. It was all biblical. But the music style contradicted the message. When you think about rap, what do you think about? Rap music. Do you think about God? Come on, be honest with me now. Do you think about God? No, you, what, what comes to my mind? Gangster? Kill your mother? You know, AK-47? All the rest of it because it's it's gangsters it's all that's what it's simply associated with gangster style music and so the lyrics makes the music holy no listen you need music that is holy and you need lyrics that is holy because how can two it, it, it's like water and oil they don't they don't go together but you have to understand that music communicates uh, it communicates to us it it it, it, it reveals things uh, to our hearts. In uh, 1 Corinthians 14, Paul uses musical instruments to illustrate to the Corinthians that even music played a significant part to communicate a message. Because the Corinthians were actually using their spiritual gift, the tongues of another language, and speaking in the church that no one could understand. 
Imagine, imagine in this room today, one person will begin to speak Italian, one person will be, begin to speak Greek, and me, Lebanese. If I would preach to you in Lebanese right now, it would do, you, you, would, you would not profit anything. Is any ahkimaik bi Yesu al Masih suffered dammu as salib mishenek? Did you understand that? I said, Jesus shed his blood on the cross for you. Now you understood that. Well, why should I speak in tongues or language, even if I had the gift? Is it to show off? Who's understanding me? Paul is simply saying that even musical instruments should be played and understood. This is why music communicates. I'm using a principle here. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 7, And even things without life give, give in sound, whether pipe or harp except they give a distinction in the sound, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? For if the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So they usually pray, play the tune that the people can understand with the trumpet that the enemy's coming. That's a warning sign. But if they just grab the trumpet and continue to play without any kind of you know, melody, harmony, or anything like that didn't make any sense. And it's just... So music communicates. Second of all, music is a language that not only has the power to communicate, but also the power to comfort us. In 1 Samuel in 16, verse 23, and it came to pass when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul. You say, what do you mean? God has evil spirits? No, he allowed an evil spirit to come upon Saul. Remember... The evil spirit, even the devil himself, cannot do anything unless God allows them to do it. So the evil spirit came upon Saul under God's authority. He would have allowed the evil spirit to come upon him. And then David took a harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well. And the evil spirit, what happened? They departed from him. So the spirit, the, the, the music communicates. I think it was Elisha also that got musicians to play. So the prophet is able to prophesy in the king's ears and understand revelation. It was like background music. I don't, I, don't, I don't mind background music. But if it's background music to manipulate emotions and, and get you away from the word of God and the conviction of the Holy Spirit, then I'd say that's wrong. And it's got to, you've got to make sure that it's music that is comforting, not riotous. Uh, uh, not music that is, uh, you know, boisterous, but comforting. Uh, and so, uh, what's an example of that? When the children of Israel committed adultery by building a golden calf, they were playing music, they, they were dancing to it. It wasn't majestic music. It was music w where we would probably perhaps give it a title, of the world. Exodus chapter 32. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people, as they shouted, he said unto Moses, there is a noise of what? War in the camp. Sounds like war. And he said, it is not the voice of them that shout uh, for mastery, neither is the voice of them that cry for being overcome. But the noise of them that sing do I hear. And it came to pass as soon as he came nigh unto the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing and Moses' anger waxed hot and he cast the tablets of, uh, of his hands and they broke them and beneath the mount. So all that was the dancing and the singing and the carrying on. Isn't that what happens to, in some so-called Christian churches today. As a matter of fact, just recently, in one of these charismatic churches, they had a mosh pit. You know what a mosh pit is? They mimic the, the, the atmosphere of the world where they have a mosh pit and someone from the cha uh, stage jumps and everyone has to carry them and they get carried all the way to the back and they, they, they're, they're, they're doing this on the sound of the music. And uh, that person fell and I think they hit their head and died. Florence gave me the newspaper article. And you tell me, is that sober? That's not sober. 
That's not comforting. That, that's riotous. That's crazy. That's not of God. Now, is there anything wrong with dancing? Well, if you're leaping and jumping for joy, there's nothing wrong with that. As long as it's not sensual dancing, joy of excitement, dancing for joy, no problem. When the prodigal son came home, there was dancing. It's music, but it was appropriate. It wasn't this crazy music that we hear today, worldly music that arouses the flesh. Thirdly, music must be holy. In other words, the lyrics are holy, so the music must be holy. And I believe a principle, and I say principle, emphasize it, I'm not going to stretch the context, but I believe we can do, get a principle from 2 Corinthians 6.14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship, he uses illustration here, hath righteousness with what? Unrighteousness. What communion has light with what? And so he's talking about Christians not being involved with non-Christians. And I could say, what does the lyrics, good, godly music, uh, lyrics, have to do with bad music? Music that you and I know that that's pub music. I had one guy tell me that even the hymns, you know, onwards Christian soldiers, the tune was played in the pub too. I said, oh, they had godly music in the, in the pubs, did they? Once upon a time. You, know, you, you can't use that. You know, if someone grabs music and even lyrics, they can trash it. Something good, they can make it profane by the atmosphere. And so we, we need discretion. I mean, this is an area that we do need discretion. Listen, this is an area that we do need to be led by the Holy Spirit. I don't know if people out there are led by the Holy Spirit, but I know what God has done in my heart regarding music. I'm not a musician, but I know and I hear and I understand, if, 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 does this music genre exalt Christ? Does it emphasize the word? Is it edifying me because God is being glorified? And I want to give you an illustration regarding this. Does the style of music have any fellowship with the lyrics? In other words, does the music emphasize the words that we would hear it to glorify God, to be edified? Everyone knows and understands the hymn, Amazing Grace. One of, the, one of the classical hymns. I mean, anyone got any problems with the lyrics? Beautiful. Beautiful lyrics, especially the chorus. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved the wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. And you make that as a chorus, beautiful chorus, taken from the parable of the prodigal son coming home. It's beautiful. There's nothing wrong with that. As a matter of fact, ungodly people in the world sing it, but do they know what they're singing? Some of them sing it conservatively. Some people that don't know the Lord they sing it conservatively, in the proper way. But they don't know the Lord. But then you have so-called Christians that supposedly know the Lord and use ungodly music. Why? And I want, you, I want, to, show, I want to actually show you what I've put together. It's about a three-minute clip. It's not going to be long, but I'm going to give you a disclaimer and a warning. It starts off good, but it's going to end bad. And then I have a congregational him right at the end so you can know the difference and I'm doing this for a reason because I want you to hear it and I want you to discern as it gets worse is the music glorifying the words that we're hearing or does it distract from the words and does it put emphasis on the beat does it does does the music draw us to the words or is taken I want you to be honest in this and I want you to see and hear it now Please, kids, don't start losing it. I was actually doing this in my office and some of the kids heard the music and they were horrified. I went out and they said, Dad, you've got bad music playing. I said, I know, I know. I'm not listening to it. Anyone outside, perhaps my house would have heard music. They would have thought I was backsliding. No, I was putting a little thing together so you can see or you can hear it how the music does affect our worship 
and it takes away from the lyrics. It really does. So that's, that's a disclaimer. Please, if you can't handle this, maybe you can go outside because it really gets bad. We're not, you, we're not doing this in this church setting so we can be distracted at all. We're doing this so you can hear and understand as an assignment what music of the world does to the word of God. Okay, so try not to laugh. It's a sobering, sobering lesson here, please. This is very important because the devil's using music to distract us from Christ and from the word of God. And he's using the worldly music so you can bring it back in your own life and think about yourself, glorify yourself. Music is not a performance. It's not a performance. We're not performing and so people can clap. Music is to worship God. It's not about the light and the dresses and the, and the people you know, singing in such a way. Now, I don't have any problem with closing your eyes and worshiping God. But is it because of the, the, the lyrics and your, actually your heart is lifted up in praise to God? Or is it the music that's making you do that? Because I guarantee you, take away the lyrics, the music can make you, you know, in this sensual kind of atmosphere, take you away and lost in this fantasy, and it doesn't glorify God. All right, so again, please do all that you can, because this is, it's grieving, try not to laugh, try to take this serious. All right, you ready to go? Thanks, James. the sound that saved a wretch like me piano is nice not taken away from the word i once was lost but now am found was blind but now i see Back in the day when I wasn't saved, I've been bobbing on this in my car. This is the worst. This is demonic. Wicked. This is more like it, amen. How the music can trash a good hymn gradually so who, who, who's, who says this is okay we need to stop here it's getting really bad what why can't you have grunge he heavy metal who says that oh that that's really bad well, okay who says 
Why isn't the RMB, you know, the, the, one, the funky, nice, kind of laid back? Why isn't that God uh, glorifying? Music is not neutral. Is it neutral? You can use any music to glorify God? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, sorry. I know what God has done in my heart through His Word, by His Spirit, using principles to guide me, to lead me, to have an ear even though I'm not musical. And what you hear, what you hear in the church is what you should play at home. Now, there might be a cappella, different kind, duets, and all the rest, like we heard the first one. There are some things like country style music, it doesn't violate anything, it's just, you know, different. It's not my style, but, you know, but there are others that cross that line. And you need to be very careful when it does. Because I guarantee you, when it does, the Holy Spirit's not leading you there. Because the music must be used to glorify the Lord alone. That's why it should be used. Not about our taste, our style, what we love best. It's about Him. True spiritual music exalts the Lord. And because of that, we should be edified. This leads us to the second point. An exalting walk. Singing and making melody in your hearts to who? To the Lord. So all three psalms, hymns, spiritual songs are a reflection of our praise to the Lord. True uh, edification of the believer is where when singing to the Lord, I will praise the name of God, the psalmist said, with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. This also shall please the Lord better than an ox or a bullock that have horns and hoofs. And the sacrifices were required of God. But true worship and praise of thanksgiving in its proper way is what God is pleased with. True worship is received from the Lord when it's sung from our hearts. It says here, in your heart, making melody in your heart. It's wonderful to be able to sing from our hearts, even though we perhaps don't have a, 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 you know, a beautiful voice. In our hearts making melody, singing from our hearts is so important. The preacher once said, the most important place for us to have a melody unto God is in our heart. Many who can't sing a, a beautiful melody with the voice can have a beautiful melodies in their heart. Singing to the Lord. You know, God never ever wanted lip service. Did you know that? He always wanted songs from the heart. He even said it to to his people. He answered and he said, Well have Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites. It is written, This people honour me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. How but in vain do they worship me? In vain. So you've got people that are religious. They're out there. They worship God, but they worship God in vain. Why? Because it's not from the heart. It's not for the Lord. And it's a sad reality when people sing with their lips, but not with their hearts. Listen, brethren, let me tell you something. We don't need sensual music to arouse us, to arouse our emotion, to sing to the Lord. It's almost like some Christians can't sing unless they have that music. You don't need that. You don't need to be filled with worldly music to sing from your heart to the Lord. What do you need? You need to be filled with the Spirit. Because I guarantee you, your heart will sing to the Lord with and or without instruments. Although it's nice to have instruments. You don't need sensual sensual music. People say, yeah, but the hymns, the hymns are dead. Yeah, they're dead when they're sung by people who are not spirit-filled. That's when they're dead. That's when they're dead. They're dead is when a, when, a, when a Christian, listen to me, comes in church and is not spirit-filled and they're in la-la land and they're not worshipping the Lord. They're not making melody in their heart. They're in their own zone, lost. They're just, they know the words and they just their mouth is moving but their heart is not worshipping. That's sad. That's sad. When you're spirit-filled, 
Man, you can't wait to sing. You want to sing. You want to worship God. You don't need that other music. That's not an excuse to worship God. It's you being filled with the Spirit of God. Spirit-filled Christians worship from the heart. Psalm 42 verse 8, Yet the Lord will command His loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night His song shall be with me. In the night. Spirit-filled people, listen, worship God even in dreadful circumstances. Dreadful. Bad. Today you have Christians that are living in comfort, they don't even sing from the heart to the Lord. They're laid back. They've got everything. They don't even worship the Lord. You've got Paul and Silas who were beaten. Their backs were ripped open. They were put in stocks and handcuffs and bonds, thrust in a dirty prison. And you know what they did in midnight? You know what they did? They prayed and they sung. Praise to God. It's what the Bible says in Acts. They sung praises under God. Now we're talking about their backs are ripped open. We're talking about midnight. They're not in the church service with nice air condition. In the summer to, to be cool, in the winter to be warm. They're in a, they're in a perhaps a prison that is filthy, their back is leaking with blood, and they're praying and singing. Now, how does one do that? They're filled with the Spirit. Well, that's what we're going to see in the next session. That a Spirit-filled Christian, they're satisfied. They give thanks to God because you understand when you're praising God, there's always thanksgiving there. They weren't saying, why me, why me, why me, why me? They already knew that they were going to be persecuted for righteousness' sake. So much so, listen, that these prisoners that were with them heard them. Their testimony impacted others, especially the Philippian jailer. A preacher once said, the drunks make a fool of themselves, but the spirit-filled Christian glorifies God and is willing to be a fool for Christ's sake. The drunk calls attention to himself while the spirit-filled believer is a witness for Christ. They were just living Christianity. They were just going, loving the Lord. Today, in our Christianity, one thing happens, murmuring, complaining, no thanksgiving, no singing, oh, poor me. And it's not even because of the gospel. It's just sorrow upon sorrow because Christians today don't understand what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. They don't understand what it means to be controlled by the Spirit of God. And this whole lesson, brethren, is so that you are aware that being filled is a requirement, it is a command that we obey, making sure that nothing is hindering the work of God in our life. So what hinders our worship? when we're not walking in the Spirit of God. A preacher said, make sure that you are filled with the Spirit so that He may totally control your life. To be filled with is not something you have to wait for. Neither it is something that a sovereign uh, God acts, uh, neither it is something that a, as a sovereign act of God that comes over you. It's an exhortation. I believe that. You don't go and wait in the upper room and uh, wait for the Holy Spirit because there's more to be had. I'm saved, I'm indwelt. Now I need to be filled so I can speak in another tongue and do signs and wonders and have a demonstration of the Spirit and power. No, my friend, listen. The signs of a Spirit-filled person is to speak the Word boldly, speaking psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, being Scripture-filled. Listen, and no matter what happens to me, I'm always praising God. We had COVID and we had cowards. Not spirit-filled. Don't know their scripture. 
Don't know and understand what we're supposed to do as Christians when we're in a situation like that. We keep speaking the truth and we keep preaching the gospel and we keep singing to the Lord when they wanted to gag us, when they want to put a muzzle on our mouth, stop our services, stop us from meeting. And I guarantee you, spirit-filled Christians, no one understand the book. And they're not doing it so they can the government. It's not about that. It's not about a mission statement. It's not even about, look at us, you know, we continued. No. It's being led by the Spirit of God to do what God authority, uh, gave authority for us to do, and that's to worship God here on earth. To lift up Christ and to tell people about the Lord. God will never lead us otherwise, brethren. Never. He would never lead us away from the Great Commission. He will never lead us away from doing that which glorifies him. Remember when the disciples were glorifying Jesus? On the, on the, uh, when Jesus was on the donkey going to Jerusalem and the Pharisees saw it when they were saying, Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Hosanna in the highest. And then the Pharisees didn't like it. It's like our system today. Shh, tell them to shut up. Shh, tell them to be quiet. What did Jesus say? If you shut them up, guess what the rocks will do? <laughs> the rocks will shout out. Because you and I, we were made to worship God. That's why we were made. All things were created by him and for him. We were made to worship him. Listen. We weren't made to worship ourselves. And you know what the devil uses today? So people and Christians can do through music to worship themselves. Just because you put good godly lyrics doesn't excuse your sensual lust to gratify the flesh. God knows it and you know it. God knows it and you know it. You say, you know my motive? No, I know mine. Even in soul winning. I said, maybe I can go watch a football game where there's all music, TAB gambling. Uh, you know, we've, we've got some you know, ladies that are in uh, their underwear dancing up and down. Maybe I can go watch a football game and give out some tracks. Oh, just give out some tracks. It's an excuse for every little buzz that Charlie wanted. No, I said, no, I know why I wanted to go, Lord. Giving out of tracks was just an excuse. No, I don't want to go. I'm done with that atmosphere. I'm done. I don't want it. And you know what? To me, that was the leading of the Holy Spirit in my life. That's what he was doing in my life. Brethren, don't use Christian vernacular for an excuse to pamper the flesh. Worship God in truth. Worship God in holiness. Worship God in his word. Worship the Lord. Amen? Amen. That's, what, that's when you're spirit filled. That's where he leads us to speak the word of God in psalms and hymns to sing him, making melody in our hearts to who? The Lord. For him. Let's pray.